I never used to believe in the supernatural. To me, the world was a realm governed by logic and reason. But all of that changed when I installed those new cameras in my home. My house stood nestled on the edge of a dense, ancient forest, shrouded in perpetual twilight. The windows were old and creaky, and the wind whistled through the cracks, creating an eerie symphony that echoed through the darkened hallways. It was the kind of place that seemed to harbor secrets. Every night, I'd wake up to the frantic barking of my loyal dog, Max. He would stand at the window, his hackles raised, teeth bared, and eyes locked onto something outside. I'd rush to his side, expecting to find an intruder or a wild animal, but there was never anything there. Just the impenetrable darkness of the forest. Even though I saw nothing, I had a mix of curiosity and fear, I decided to install surveillance cameras around the house. I needed to see what Max was barking at night after night. It was a grueling task, drilling holes in the walls while struggling to suppress the sensation of being watched. The thought of not being alone in my house was unbearable. Finally, the cameras were all in place, their red blinking lights casting eerie glows on the walls. I spent the entire day setting up the recording system, ensuring every angle was covered. When night fell, I huddled in front of the monitor, watching the live feed from each camera. The night was quiet. Max lay next to me, his low growls echoing the unease in my gut. Hours passed, and the clock ticked toward the usual time Max would start barking. But nothing happened. The forest remained still, and I began to feel a sense of relief. Maybe it had all been in my head. Then, as the clock struck 2 a.m., I saw it. A shadowy figure emerged from the depths of the forest. Its emaciated frame was unnaturally tall, with limbs that seemed elongated and twisted, like gnarled tree branches. Its skin, if you could call it that, was pallid and appeared to be stretched too tightly over its skeletal frame, giving it an unsettling, cadaverous appearance. The face of the figure was a nightmare etched in flesh and shadows. Long, matted strands of hair obscured most of its features, but what I could see sent shivers down my spine. Its eyes, or what I assumed were eyes, were the most disturbing aspect. They were entirely white, devoid of pupils or irises, like two empty voids that gazed into the abyss. And it had no eyelids, just those unblinking orbs that stared without end. Its mouth was a gaping maw of broken, jagged teeth, as if it had never known the pleasure of a soft meal. The skin around its mouth appeared stretched, almost as if it had been forced into a perpetual, grotesque smile. The figure moved with an eerie, unnatural grace, gliding rather than walking, as if it defied the laws of physics. Its movements were silent, yet every step sent chills down my spine, and while its physical appearance was nightmarish, it was its relentless, malevolent presence that chilled me to the core. The figure moved with the same unnatural grace, gliding towards the window where Max stood. I gasped, my heart pounding as I watched the impossible unfold before my eyes. It reached out a bony hand, and Max's barking intensified, echoing my own terror. That night, I stayed up, unable to tear my eyes away from the monitor. The figure just stood there, staring at me through the camera with empty, soulless eyes. It was as if it knew I was watching, as if it was taunting me. Morning came, and I rushed to review the footage and maybe post it online. But to my horror, all the recordings from that night were deleted, replaced by hours of static. My hands trembled as I realized that whatever was out there didn't want to be seen. I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that had settled over me. Night after night, I'd watch the figure approach the window, and Max's barking became more desperate, more terrified. But there was one night, after a week of torment, 
when something changed. As I shifted through the footage, I noticed a single segment that had miraculously survived the erasure. It was just five minutes long. At the start, it was normal, me sleeping soundly, Max at the edge of the bed, the camera fixed on the window. But two minutes in, the figure didn't walk to the window this time. It came from the hallway, a place that should have been locked tight. Panic surged through me as I watched it glide towards the camera. Its full white, pupil-less eyes bore into me. For three agonizing minutes, it stared, and I could hear its labored, rasping breaths through the speaker. Then, without warning, the feed descended into static once more. I was trapped in a living nightmare, and the figure's intrusion into my home was an undeniable reality. I knew I had to confront it, but I also realized that I had no idea how to stop something that shouldn't exist. The figure's presence was beyond any logic or reason I had ever known, and I was left with a haunting question, what did it want from me, and how could I protect myself from its relentless gaze as the nights went on, the figure's presence grew darker, more oppressive. It seemed to become more aware of me, as if it relished the fear that coursed through my veins like icy tendrils. The relentless, unblinking gaze haunted my dreams, and I found myself questioning the very fabric of reality. I tried to convince myself that it was all a twisted dream, a waking nightmare born from the depths of my own psyche. But each night, as I watched the surveillance footage, the figure's existence became undeniable. It wasn't a product of my imagination, it was a malevolent force that defied explanation. One day, as I ventured into the hallway, I noticed something that sent a new wave of terror through me. Scratches marred the walls, deep and jagged, as if something had tried to claw its way in. The message they spelled out was chilling, let me in, but it was written in a way that made it clear this was no mere plea, it was a sinister demand. For a week, the figure didn't return, and I began to hope that it had lost interest or moved on. But then, one fateful night, at exactly 2 a.m., the doorbell rang, shattering the silence of my home. My heart pounded in my chest as I crept to the door, a sense of dread coursing through me. There, on the doorstep, was a grotesquely wrapped present, its paper mudded and torn, as if it had been handled by unseen hands. It was adorned with crimson stains that sent a chilling message. Slowly, I unwrapped it, my hands trembling with fear. Inside the package, I found a gruesome sight a severed deer's head, its eyes staring blankly into oblivion. Written on the inside of the box, in what appeared to be blood, was a single word, present.